I'm Angela. I'm going to talk about my work, which spans a number of different areas at times. If it seems to kind of not fit within your interest, I just ask you to bear with me. For me, it's, it's very common that I'm kind of traversing different worlds. So there's, I interject from, from various disciplines and I'm getting used to doing it. But if, if you're not, it might feel slightly disorienting at times. Um, okay, so going to cover why spatial audio rocks because it does um, distance why it's mess why I'm calling it a messier science what place art might have when something's already a mess um, and what place mess has when something's or, or not already an art so it's kind of work out the titles and retrospectively fit your content to that I think and I like those titles so I've had to write the presentation around it so why spatial audio rocks there are a number of reasons for it um, so let's start off. Exciting times. I think at the moment we've seen big growth in the market, driven by technologies, new technologies, lots of investment from really big companies. So that means that technologies are evolving at a really rapid pace and um, it's being encouraged and moved forward. The technologies are allowing us to do that. And as a result, that makes it pretty exciting. This in turn is being driven, um, as I say, by new technologies, things like VR, AR, and object-based audio. Those allow us to have new kinds of experiences, new affordances, new subjectivities as people that go into a subjective experience. Um, for example, you know, the kind of virtual yet somehow embodied experience of VR um, and those afford new kinds of narrative possibilities for people that make any kind of content. So all of these things, I think, make it super exciting. Um, and the fact that it's a spatial medium. Sorry, I'll go, I'll go back. Oh, you can't go back. Um, the fact that it's a spatial medium, I'll, t I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. But I find that that, to me, is a really compelling, unifying um, part of why I find it exciting. These technologies challenge some of our perceptive capabilities through um, intercepting the point between where we have the se sensory information um, being made available to us and our interpretation. So we aren't able with immersive technologies to differentiate as well between kind of uh, real previous experience or current experience and virtual prior or current experience. And that has some... Um, potentially concerning applications and some work is being done, possibly not enough, I would say, uh, to, to deal with what those implications might be, particularly de developmentally. So <clears throat> in the years that I've been looking and researching and, and making stuff for VR, the age, the kind of guidance, which by the way is provided by people that manufacture the hardware, the guidance on minimum age for kids basically to start using the technology has dropped a couple of years so for a certain period of time it was it was 14 playstation brought it down to 12 at a certain point um at this point in time i'm not sure where it is but i'm pretty sure it's going to be difficult to hold back that interest from kids and what does it mean if we're in these environments where we're not able to easily differentiate between the real and the virtual how does it as us, as, as adults, as content creators, as custodians, what is our role there really in making sure that young people and, and particularly those in formative development stage are not going to suffer um, any negative consequences of this. Not to paint it all, all black, I think technology always has, as Heidegger said, um, potential saving grace and potential dangers. And the saving grace of these kinds of technologies is that they have amazing um, uh, therapeutic applications, things like dealing with, with phobias, um, preparing people for medical procedures, having patients have more understanding of their own bodily systems, having medical professionals train remotely, as with every technology, right? So, so there are always... Um, Kind of proportionate advantages and disadvantages but it's something to think about because of this lack of differentiation that we have uh, these technologies are distinct from conventional media conventional media generally has privileged gaze and sound is a bigger deal in these technologies 
whether people notice it or not is a kind of side issue. Um, but George Lucas famously said that uh, sound is 50% of the movie going experience in immersive technologies. We're saying as a community that it's more. <laughs> Someone's probably attached a, a percentage to that, who knows? But it is a really big part of it. So for me, that's obviously really exciting. I would add the caveat that doesn't mean that people are gonna notice it, but that's okay. Um, so thinking about the relationship between sound and image and how sound has generally been, um, images being foregrounded, Michel Chion has talked about the notion of synchrosis, which is a sound image bonding, forging of signification through sound image um, synchrony. And he says, sound adds value by creating the definite impression in the immediate or remembered experience one has of it that this information or expression naturally comes from what's seen and what is already contained in the image itself. Added value is what gives the eminently incorrect impression that sound is unnecessary, that sound, and this is the part I emphasize, duplicates a meaning which in reality sound brings about, either on its own or by discrepancies between it and the image. So, obviously, a theorist like Michel Chion and probably all of you guys in the room and certainly myself, we're interested in this relationship between sound and image. We understand that sound is super important. Um, but here, Chion is really saying to us that we don't, as a general populace, we wouldn't ascribe the significance to sound that it has. It actually brings about such a significant amount, but, you know, it's taken to be innate in the visual cues um, in a piece of media and spatial audio rocks because it's slightly addressing that okay second reason why spatial audio rocks interdisciplinarity so this is a word that's you know commonly coined and I just said to you sorry if my talk's meandering I'm an interdisciplinary person but I do think that spatial audio practitioners really are in a good position to be interdisciplinary in a very fundamental sense so not just um, kind of paying lip service to it I like to something that's helped me in my own work <clears throat> is thinking about this uh, the, the kind of quadrant that has been you know people have talked about in um, interdisciplinary studies before so in this quadrant you have science art engineering and design and I guess at first glance we might think that science and engineering have more commonality, art and design have more commonality, but all of these quadrants have a relationship to all other parts. So science and art are, well, engineering and design have more of a focus on utility. So they want to get things working, they're very pragmatic. Science and art aren't necessarily interested in getting it working that it works they're interested in how it works why it works and sometimes they might go a step further and interrogate what it means for something to work what's the social context what's the cultural reference what you know what's the kind of perceptual uh, instability behind our ideas our very notions of what makes something work and then i would say as a practitioner i definitely have a relationship between art and engineering because at times like for example, I'm making a piece of work, I, you know, I get asked to put it somewhere, I'm an engineer in that moment, I need to be very pragmatic and just draw a straight line between two points and get it working. There's no, there's no place for asking questions of why or how in those moments. So the more I think you live, practice, work as an interdisciplinary person, the more integrated these areas become and the less they feel like distinct um, personas that you need to adopt I don't know in terms of research I have to say I still feel quite schizof schizophrenic I have a science output and I have an arts output the two don't talk um, it's like I'm two different people but I think that will change I think you know as, as with anything the top line of interdisciplinarity is discussed um, and then eventually it, it becomes embodied in practice so I think spatial audio requires an understanding of engineering you you know it's it, it's better than it was a few years ago but you really still have to hack solutions there aren't end-to-end -end solutions so you do need to know um, how to make that work technically I think 
that should be built upon a foundation of some kind of perceptual understanding of how human beings uh, discriminate in auditory terms. One of the really encouraging things I uh, heard at the recent audio for AR and VR conference, AES conference in um, Washington state was that, I mean, there were a lot of kind of big players because of the fact it was, it was where it was. DSP guys, audio programmers from Facebook and Microsoft um, and Valve, and they all discussed how we need to start modeling perceptually. So physical modeling in spatial audio, in, in real time applications of spatial audio, is it's just not feasible, really, especially when you're thinking about mobile VR and, and, and mobile AR, where you need to get things working on a mobile phone. Um, and perceptual modeling takes the elements that human beings are attuned to and makes use of those. It doesn't try to recreate objective reality. It just says, how do we hear? And let's work with that. It's actually a more economic approach. So I do think these areas are talking to each other, even though specialities are established and these divisions are established. I think I'm seeing examples in the field of people that have a foot in at least two camps. And those role models didn't exist, didn't, as far as I know, didn't exist. Uh, you know, years ago, it was siloed. And now I see lots of examples of people where I think, wow, that's me. And I think that's what we need in industry. I think we need to see role models for people who embody these things. And then it makes it, it gives you a sense of possibility that you could do it too. So that's been important for me. Okay, it also rocks because the rules are unwritten. It's also challenging because the rules are unwritten. Um, I feel like it's really a, 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 an important practice I have to not know things. So all the pre-existing knowledge um, that we import into a new technology might not serve that technology fully. For example, in reimagining time in a spatial medium, I think is a really key part of making full use of the unique affordances of this medium. And what do I mean by that? If we think about DAWs, if we think about music scores, even environments like Pure Data or Tidal Cycles, any of these quite current uh, ways of making music um, and also historical ways of notating music and thinking about music is very linear. So even we're working with, um, uh, I mean, maybe games audio is slightly different, but many other audio applications are quite linear and we tend to really privilege time and we tend to think of time in a very kind of sequential manner. If we think about a spatial medium, we can't privilege time in that same way if we're fully thinking about that medium. I remember going to a talk uh, with people from Google and they talked about their narrative devices for creating content in um, VR and they had as their, um, as a kind of storyboard, because how do you storyboard for something like VR? If you're, you know, we've got a lot of film people in VR, we've got a lot of games people in VR and they've got quite different sensibilities and, and maybe priorities, I don't know. But in terms of getting something that works for the medium, Google had just got this simple X, Y axis with time on one axis and um, location on the other. And they, they mapped events that happened. So you actually had some representation of, of time. So it was a kind of two dimensional rather than purely sequential um, representation of what is possible. I would say that, you know, if we're reimagining things like time um, and how important time would be, it's, it's challenging because of the fact that we live in a highly time pressured world. Uh, and I can't see that changing. I, I see that getting progressively more challenging. So the fact that we have an infinite information horizon, every, all the information that ever was in theory is instantly accessible to us. So that can be quite overwhelming. As great as it can be, it can actually be quite overwhelming. We feel like we need to know a lot of stuff. We end up with less time. Um, and, and as a result of, of that, but many other things about uh, 21st century living, where we do feel um, like time is a scarce resource, I think media sometimes is um, set to serve a very boundary purpose. And what I mean by that is that we watch it we consume it in very boundary ways. We either consume it for very specific periods of time, like maybe we do something in the morning before we come to college, maybe we do something at lunch if we're at home, maybe we do something on the weekend, in the evening, 
um, is a very specific period. So then again, we're, we're bounded by time. I also think we're bounded by space with that. We're tethered to a particular device. You know, if you're working with VR, welcome to desktop hell. Um, we might be bounded to a particular location. We might be bounded to a particular uh, network. So thinking about a spatial medium and really kind of setting our imagination free in that will be a challenge, I, th I think. In some respects, in, in, to compound that, in some respects, it's unavoidable that we'll import unconscious biases into any new medium. But given the emotional effective nature of immersive media at a corporeal level, um, our ability to apply this kind of critical distancing to step back from this immersive environment, from our rushed um, lives, and really think about things deeply, think about the ethical impacts, think about the creative possibilities, I think, I think that's really key. I think it's really important. My background is in the arts, and in the arts, we talk about critical distance and criticality a lot. And a kind of contemporary, unless I'm out of the loop, which could be, I, I'm interdisciplinary now, so I don't know who I am. But um, a contemporary way of looking at critical distancing is not that, you know, I'm, I'm considering this thing called VR, let's say, and I take a step back from it and I examine it from a number of different angles, which was a, you know, it was, it was the view up to a point. Now we're saying that we can't, we can't extricate ourselves from it. We're always enmeshed with it. We're always living synergistically with technology, with ourselves, with others. We're in a very connected world. It's actually not possible to have a dispassionate or disconnected critical distance. But within that, we need to create a space for reflection. Um, when faced with a totally new situation, we tend always to attach ourselves to the objects, to the flavour of the most recent, recent past. We look at the present through a rear view mirror. We march backwards into the future. That's McLuhan, um, famously said about our approach to new things. And I'll get another depressing quote out of the way and then I'll tell you <laughs> why things aren't that bad. Um, achieving critical distance from which to think about and maybe design sound is difficult when one's continually immersed in a sonic field. So this idea of critical distance in immersive technologies is super important and difficult, but I think, I think it's important. Okay, spatial audio also rocks because prospects. So uh, this is pretty much an anecdotal point. I don't have the statistics back it up, but there are always, in my Google alerts, there are always feeds coming through telling me that the market's growing. So I can only assume that prospects are great. I, a couple of years ago, was part of a Slack channel for spatial audio and VR, something, something fairly generic like that. And it was a really vibrant channel. And I was chatting to a lot of people, mostly on the West Coast of America, I have to say. Um, it's two years on, I'm still doing the same PhD. I'm, you know, I, I'm still doing stuff, stuff that I love, but these people are like quite senior in spatial audio land. So it's not, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lack of um, supply to the growing market. So I think the prospects in this area are great, actually. Gender balance, I will say, in some places, I think there is gender balance in this area. I am running an event in uh, London this coming weekend, three days, and I've got a really good gender balance on, on one, uh, one out of the three days. And last year when I ran it, I had an I had a equally good gender balance for some reason, and I don't know why. It seems like there is more of an openness with um, gender in spatial audio. Certainly in arts practice, I would say that there's lots of women or non-binary people that are drawn towards space and a spatial medium and I can only again say that anecdotally but given that this is a new medium given that we don't want to if we can avoid it import unconscious biases and we want to have critical distance I think diversity is going to be a great thing for spatial audio okay potential applications I'll say a few words on this because it's a kind of abyss really it rocks because there's so many different things you can do with it. It's pretty open. It's up for grabs. So some examples um, thematically, really, rather than specifically. 
with spatial audio, you can improve an existing experience. So there is a thing called cinema. People go to it. We've had surround systems in there for some time, but now Dolby Atmos exists and that gives you an improved auditory experience in a cinema. Um, unusual media experiences. So it's like we have speakers, um, we have performances using speakers, electroacoustic stuff, for example. But now we have interesting speaker array arrays that are doing interesting things. More, more on this guy later, because this is a favorite guy of mine. Um, so we go from something that's familiar to something that's less familiar to something that's unfamiliar, new media experiences. Uh, so VR is being used, and I would say it's not just put someone in a headset, put them on a roller coaster at this point. Um, theater are using VR in really interesting ways. For example, theater are an example of a discipline that has been working spatially and immersively forever. That's what they do. So um, it doesn't surprise me that there's some nice work being done with uh, people from theater. And you guys, as at my home institution, Queen Mary, are in a good position because you can collaborate with theater people. I don't know, how anyone here from theater? Yay, one, one lone soldier at the back. Um, you can collaborate with this l lone fella who's clearly interested at the back. Uh, you know, people are up for it. I don't know where your theatre um, department are going, but they probably have things like surround sound, motion capture. They're open to working with technologists. And I think, you know, we can draw inspiration from lots of different areas, but theatre has a pretty established set of practices um, around this. You could go out with a higher order ambisonic microphone into a rainforest, primary rainforest and document it. So I think this is a great use of ambisonic um, recordings is to go into an area that is pristine, of which there are very, very few in the world now. Most places on earth are affected by man-made sound. There are very few places that are not. And those the places that are are being encroached upon increasingly. So this guy, David Monarchy, has been going into different parts, different um, uh, remote spots in the world to record and document the sound. And ambisonics in this environment is a perfect application. I mean, you're really getting like a detailed representation, a, a moment in time of the sound. If anyone's interested in acoustic ecology and documentation of the natural environment, I would encourage you to check out Bernie Krauss who writes at length about how soundscape recording and documentation is a better representation than a visual um, documentation. Because in dense environments like this, you don't see so much um, of the fauna, and but you do hear them. And indeed, that's, that's why they've developed sonically. It's because they don't see each other either, but they have to communicate. Um, accessibility, I don't, I, I'm kind of, I'll defer to Mariana on this, but there is, there's interesting work being done here with spatial audio. Again, all of this work is very diverse, so it really is open. Okay, so distance. Why am I calling it messier? Well, it's underrepresented comparatively, and by that I mean relative to things like directional localization, azimuth, um, even elevation, you know, azimuth is the thing that's most measurable. Uh, so people measure it. Elevation, we're less good at discriminating, so less people tend to, to research that distance. <laughs> people have, you know, just kind of, oh, that's not a good career move, um, which is why I like it. Uh, our knowledge of distance hearing is deficient compared to our knowledge of directional hearing. This deficiency is due to the extraordinary complexity of the subject. So there isn't a huge amount of literature out there. And the literature that exists out there doesn't have consensual methodologies. So when I began literature reviewing, I was like, oh, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this. And then if you're working with audio visual, you can do this, you can do this. It's just people are trying out things. It's quite an experimental space. And I liked that but it is also means that you're kind of scrabbling around trying to find things that work. Um, there's a lack of consensus, as I've said, on experimental design. Much of the research, research that exists depends up, 
upon comparisons across diverse types of investigations by different researchers in environments which have varied in multiple ways. So it's very, it's very hard to draw out generalizations um, from a kind of community around it, particularly when you come to dealing with audiovisual in immersive environments. I think that's even more challenging. So I am showing you a piece of analysis from a study which I ran using a methodology which I decided upon after trying out a bunch of different things. I thought, OK, I'm measuring people's auditory discrimination in VR and other immersive environments. How do I do How do people do that? So I tried presence questionnaires, which is self-reporting, very problematic when it comes to sound. I tried um, unconscious measures like galvanic skin response or electrodermal activity. Really interesting, but very noisy and people are in a novel environment. So ultimately very difficult to get at the detail. I tried out other uh, measures like respiration, other self-reporting measures. I knew that people were, were discriminating, but that my their knowledge was falling between the gaps of, the, of what I was actually measuring. So I thought, I just need to, I don't know how to do this, but I began searching around. I found this thing called the repertory grid technique. It's a subjective measure, uh, a subjective method, which has been used from personal construct psychology. It's been taken into things like consumer psychology. You basically ask people to free verbalize similarities and differences on comparing different sets of stimuli. So you don't leave them at all. So that's quite nice because they get to tell you in their terms what things mean. From those, you derive bipolar constructs. If they don't, if they give you one pole of a construct and not the other, you, you probe them a bit. That's but there's no leading of the participant at any point. Once you've got this bipolar construct, it then becomes a Likert scale. You can ask people to rate things numerically. So you can translate that into numerical data, which then you can run a you know statistical analysis on which is useful and it means you're not missing out on anything falling between the cracks really. Um, so I did the quantitative analyses on that uh, in the first pass on data and at the moment I'm looking at the verbal descriptors to see is there some kind of pattern, is there a pattern in the way people are describing things, is there a pattern in the way that audio experts and non-audio experts are describing things, is there a pattern in the way that people that are really accurate in auditory distance discrimination and those that are not is, is there any just looking for patterns so here just to explain what this is in brief uh this is a burton plot which is a common uh diagram when you're using repertory good technique you have the construct uh on left and right side the stimuli in the middle from the apex to the left those are incongruent stimuli so by incongruent i had uh cinematic vr clips which had mismatched distance in audio and visual terms. So the visual, the visual was, was always consistent. They, they had a choice of, of different visuals. And then I'd mismatch the audio distance to that. So the apex to the left is all incongruent. And where the cell is dark red, that means they've rated it as incongruent. From S2 to the, to the far right is all congruent. So that should all be white if they were all 100 percent accurate um, because white represents them rating it as congruent and dark red as incongruent right so you can see pretty much these guys have got a, a, a pretty good balance there's a couple of um, stimuli s4 and s1 that aren't quite doing what they should do but that seemed to be consistent across participants and other than that it's looking okay the thing is with this diagram is this is just my six top accurate participants so they're, they're not bad, um, but you can see the participant numbers are on the side. You can see the constructs that they use. And um, if you look at the inaccurate participants, it's a little bit less. Uh, there's a little bit less of a pattern going on. So people are not particularly good. Um, interestingly, and this is why I say, you know, the expertise doesn't exist in, in spatial audio. The top six accurate participants were 50% audio, 50% non-audio people. And that was a shock, actually. I kind of, I kind of had assumed or, or predicted that there would be a much higher proportion of uh, accuracy amongst audio participants, but that's not the case. 
um, some of the these rated constructs. So this is where they they numerically rated them. Um, these are some of the constructs just to give you context. And these are the ones that I could easily map to, map to um, the poles of congruent or incongruent. I would say uh, always evaluate your evaluation. So for me, even though I'm really happy with this method and it gives me a really rich data set of which I can just poke at it from lots of different angles, I still, I'm still planning to evaluate it. So for example, if I run the same tests with a Mushra test design and get the same kinds of results, I've wasted a lot of my time, good to know. I won't be doing RGT again, but you know, will I get the same results or not? I also think it's important for me as a practitioner to include ecologically valid stimuli in tests. So not just to have these very dry, controlled um, data sets against which people are experiencing a rating. And there is, there is a lot of value to that, but I also want to draw out, okay, like can any of this be applied into stuff that's relevant for a practitioner? Or, or are they really distinct worlds at this point in time? From talking to some colleagues today and from my own experience, the thing I would say about VR is because it's so novel and so immersive, it's really difficult to get to the detail. And there are people that are trying to, like I'm trying to get to the detail around auditory discrimination, but my colleagues are doing completely different things and their designs are so detailed and robust and amazing. And, you know, everyone's in there kind of just <laughs> playing games effectively in their own heads. Um, so I, I think that in terms of ecological validity, I, I don't know. I don't know what I'll get, but I'm, I'm interested to at least try. At this point, I feel like we might be, it might be too soon. I think maybe we need to let people live in virtual environments for longer so that they then will be able to give you more conscious and detailed feedback about their experiences at the moment. That's just not, um, that's just not what I've been getting. And I also want to draw out any relationship or at least seek to and answer the question of is there a relationship between quali qualitative and quantitative um, analyses okay perceptual discrimination i can't avoid this i'm afraid auditory distance discrimination well it's impacted quite heavily by visual information so it's, it's something called visual capture where visual cues will guide our responses to what's happening and where and when and various other things we we're highly visually biased even if we're audio people so that will uh, dominate your participants answers um, it's also affected by experimental design for example we're much better at relative than absolute distance discrimination uh, even things like order of presentation in stimuli in, in trials will affect uh, results we're influenced by non-perceptual factors things like how our level of overall arousal and you're very aroused when you're in a immersive environment and particularly if you haven't been in one uh, many times our assessment of the valence for a sound event um, the familiarity of the source itself all of these things affect distance discrimination basically we're systematically biased um, and inaccurate when it comes to auditory distance discrimination so um, we're most accurate at distances of, of about a meter and that's not the case for visual distance ju judgments. We have this thing called auditory distance compression, where we send events, we will perceive events or you know, report our discrimination of, of aud close auditory events further away. So we kind of push them away from us. And if they're far away, we'll kind of draw them in. So effectively, we're compressing them into a more middle ground. And I, I have thought about this. And I thought, OK, rather than make this the enemy of like, oh, this thing exists and it's going to it's going to mess up my results. I think, well, what are the what are the kind of adaptive advantages of this? And I think there might be some. So it kind of makes sense. Uh, I mean, visual capture makes absolute sense. So we perceive auditory information really quickly. It's got le it demands less cognitively than processing visual information. So if we process it quickly, and it's not consuming much of our cognitive bandwidth, then we can orient to the event in the environment that's salient, that's really important, and then we can fine tune um, our discrimination of that event visually. That takes more of our um, cognitive capacity, but it's a much more efficient process. So that kind of makes sense adaptively. This compressed um, 
this auditory distance compression effect. I've thought about it, and this is entirely speculative, uh, in terms of salience. So if there's an event that's important and it's really far away, it probably is adaptively advan advantageous to bring that closer towards me so that I will be motivated to do something about it, to respond. If it's really close, it's probably adaptively adv advantageous to push that away so that I will respond rather than think there's nothing I can do about it. That feels a bit more tenuous, that part of it, but um, I'm trying to make friends with some of these systematic biases. Uh, just in case, you know, I'm not assuming that anyone knows about auditory distance discrimination, some of the cues, some of the most important cues include intensity, temporal delay, uh, frequency content of sound sources whether based on whether they're near or far, um, interaural level dis differences and interaural time differences, and that means the, the sound pressure level reaching you uh, at different, different ears um, at different intensities and there being a slight delay. If a sound source is over here, it will reach this ear first. It will be louder at this ear first. And direct to reverberant ratio. So if I speak to you directly, you're getting my direct um, sound wave propagation and then you'll also get perhaps not so much in here, but you'll generally get a reflection uh, off the ground or um, off a wall or something. So those give us most of the information that we need to discriminate distance. So take all of this, the systematic biasing and uh, the fact that we're inaccurate, and what does it, how, does it, how does it sit in an immersive environment? Any, any guesses whether it's improved? Uh, no, it diminishes when examining audiovisual environments. And again, when that environment is rich, virtual or immersive, work's shown, for example, that headsets induce underestimation of distance. So it's even more challenging. This is what my experimental uh, stimuli looked like, the S1 to 9 that you saw in the diagram previously. <clears throat> it was thrilling, it's a narrative high. Uh, there's three of me, I press a buzzer twice in each position and I'm at different distances to camera or at the same, difference to ca same distance to camera, either indoors or outdoors. So that's kind of it. There's four stimuli there, but then if I take four and I make them congruent and I take another four and make them incongruent, I've got eight unique stimuli. So that's what I did um, to some poor participants before I, this is at the point I'm not working on ecologically valid stuff. What did I find out? Discrimination for global ratings of congruent stimuli significantly approved, improved in non-equidistant conditions. So let me just explain what I mean by global. Each person had the opportunity to rate the video as a whole, as a kind of self-contained thing, like this video, do you think it's congruent? Or I didn't use the words congruent as their construct, whatever that meant, but rate it on a scale of zero to four. And they were able to do that for the, for the video clip as a whole. If they wanted to, I did, they didn't have to provide a global rating, they had to provide at least one rating. So they could either provide a global and or local rating. The local ratings were, do you want to rate the person to your right, to your centre or to the left? Were they, you know, if the, if the construct was real or unreal, you know, do you want to rate the person on the left for that? Do you want to rate the person on the right for that? So what, what was found was that global ratings, so where they were rating the entire video clip, um, for the congruent conditions where sound image events matched were improved in non-equidistant conditions. So um, where I was standing at different distances to camera, people were, people were better at discriminating visual capture. Global ratings of congruent stimuli were more accurately rated for both equidistant and non-equidistant um, events than incongruent stimuli. So people were better at rating congruent than incongruent stimuli. And environmental conditions didn't show up as significant at all. So looking in a little bit more detail about how people rated things, these, this is just a count of, to show you how people, whether they chose because it was a, you know, they had choice in whether they provided global and or local ratings. They provided more local ratings for incongruent stimuli um, than congruent stimuli. So interesting, that didn't lead to greater accuracy, but they were much more likely to volunteer a local rating. And they were less likely to provide local ratings for congruent stimuli compared to global ratings. So that, that made me think about a few things. So I'm just gonna go back because I'm gonna overwhelm with diagrams. So that made me think about 
the idea of gestalt. If anyone's read um, Albert Bregman's book, Auditory Scene Analysis, he talks a lot about uh, the idea of gestalt and how we will perceive a scene. If somebody is perceiving an overall scene as congruent, they may be less motivated to go on and rate things locally. Like, well, I get it, that all sounded fine. If they know that something's incongruent, they might be more motivated to rate something um, locally, but that doesn't mean that they're more accurate because it's still difficult to rate things in an immersive environment um, in, in auditory distance terms. So if we look at the local ratings, and I'm just going to ask you to look at the left um, column at this point, you can see that incongruent ratings, so, so basically all, all, these, all the events, the, the me in three positions, were either all congruent or all incongruent. So in theory, this should all be pretty equally distributed, right? They should be rating incongruent the same for each video if they were being accurate. So incongruent shows up that they are, it's not, it's not very varied. They are providing ratings. They're the wrong ratings, but they're providing them. Um, but the congruent, interestingly, kind of shows an inverse relationship between the blue column, which represents the person on the right that was closest um, in the non-equidistant conditions, and the orange, so that was the central person um, that didn't, didn't change in either equidistant or uh, non-equidistant conditions. So there's almost this inverse relationship where the person on the right is rated either extremely incongruent or extremely congruent. And I dug into that for a bit more detail. And what I found is it doesn't matter whether they're at equidistant or non-equidistant conditions. This pattern is more or less there. The person on, on the right is always extremely rated and the person in the middle is always pretty neutrally rated. So that told me that even in non-equidistant, even in equidistant conditions, you've kind of got a visual capture that goes beyond the stimuli into the next stimuli because you've seen a very up close version of the right hand uh, me in one stimulus, then you, that's kind of biasing you for subsequent stimuli. Yeah. No. 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 I did not know that left and right handedness. Okay, let's let's talk about that. Um, no, I would imagine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I guess I, I could sort of retrofit some further analyses. My sense is that because of the scaling effects of VR, um, I guess I'm, I'm just going to assume because it's easier that you've all been in a headset if you're in a if you're in a headset you realize how big people are when they come close to you like it really feel you feel really dwarfed so it's the scaling um is exaggerated in a way that doesn't represent real life so i i kind of feel like that biased people visually visually they were they were captured and what i find interesting is that that happened across stimuli um yeah i think i've said most of that I'll move on. Okay, so I'm saying it's messy, so we get it, but why am I saying it's messier? Because I say that art is messy, but science is messier. Um, well, at, at this point in time, I think it's, I think it is, I think auditory distance uh, in the most environments is messier because it's trying not to be, in a sense. I do think, and this is where I think, you know, any work that I do, I want to draw out an application from it. That's just, you know, that just is what makes sense to me as somebody that makes stuff. I think the RGT derived design is really useful. I say derived because it's, you know, the actual, there are variations on it, but the one, the, the, the design that I've used is more or less modeled off work that's been done in spatio, spatial audio quality assessment. Um, I think it's really useful. So I, even though it's a big investment of time, I would encourage people that if that's in your research area, check it out. The middle ground, and maybe this, this uh, marries into the idea of auditory distance compression, I think those cues could be an aesthetic device to foreground or make recede or anchor intentionally incongruent audiovisual events in a wider scene. Um, and the idea of intentionally incongruent audiovisual events is sort of what I'm aiming at ultimately. I want to see how we can use diegetic sound in an immersive environment in creative ways, in ways that are not modeling realism. I think that's what's interesting to me artistically. Um, I think it's more important to keep absolute distance in the middle ground and probably less important for extreme positions. 
And any aesthetic application of distance in sound must account for um, visual cue dominance. Uh, yeah, I'm doing sound only conditions. Just taking a look at the time and now I'm a little bit scared. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna speed up a little bit. Um, yeah, I think gestalts are important relative to precision. So that could help with post-processing and CPU requirements. Um, okay. Just going to start with a few contentious statements. I'm going to say sound was never authentic. Because I don't think it was. I'm going to say we don't perceive objectively. Because I don't think we do. I think it's a really actively construct a, a process of construction um, and filtering. Sound doesn't record uh, objectively. This is not as wild a statement as, as it seems. I just mean that people place cameras in particular areas and not all over the place. I mean that, you know, different microphones have different uh, polarity patterns and different frequency responses. And sound rendering is for effect. It's not, we're not aiming at a realistic representation. Um, so in order to kind of qualify that, I'm going to say that sound film is an immersive technology. So we have this big buzz around immer immersion, but immersion has existed since, um, yeah, I mean, since any sound practice really. Distance has been historically exploited in conventional 2D film sound practice. Um, through the convention of privileging speech intelligibility over spatial infidelity, or fidelity, I think that should be, but infidelity, I like the sound of. So things like ADR, um, automated dialogue replacement, means that speech has a really high position in the mix um, for, for film practice, and we record things with closed microphone techniques. That's not realistic to our um, life experience, and that convention was established despite early sound film industry practitioners, people like Maxfield and John Cass, emphatically asser asserting that sound scale should always match image scale in fixed distance um, relationships between eye and ear. And these guys were big, you know, these guys were technically really proficient and well regarded in their time. They worked for important um, companies. I am whizzing. I don't know if I'm happy to make the slides available. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Um, Maxfield wrote a series of articles uh, from 1929 to 31 about the requirement to have only one microphone during film production placed near the camera's sight line so as to achieve sound image coordination as well as capturing correct scaling for actors' distances and movements in distance. His articles were really well regarded and heavily cited for a decade after publication. He even produced something uh, that we'll see in the next slide, a microphone distance chart at a time when technicians and people on set were intuitively, but in error, according to Maxfield, placing microphones at closer distances than he was recommending. This is Maxfield's um, mic distance chart. So, I mean, he, you know, technically he really knew what he was doing, but mixing practices went on to favour choice, control and comfort rather than realistic sound image scale matching. The variety and flexibility that you had from different microphones in different places um, resulted to intelligible sound across different camera shots, from wide shots to um, close-up shots. So that was the thing that actually led to the conventions that exist today. Control sound artists, control sound levels meant artistry could be fully expressed, so you could actually play with things um, and create more uh, a piece of work, more in line with your directorial vision. And audiences preferred continuity in dialogue levels. They, d they didn't want you know, massive dynamic changes um, and uh, realistic distance information necessarily. In any case, why would realism be more effective? You know, when we think about media and what it does, it communicates with us. And how does it do that? It engages us. It, it, you know, it emotionally engages us. Is realism the best mechanism for that? Uh, does daily life necessarily engage or communicate with us optimally? Maxfield may have overlooked certain artistic functions and the technical realities and audience motivations that film serve, but film was in its very formative stages even then, even though it had been around um, for some decades at that point, sound films had not. And I would say that aiming at realistic simulation was ultimately less important than the narrative and emotional arcs of the film and the materials constraints of production. So these historical trajectories, the way that the, the technologies evolved and the practices that established over time um, from a kind of a frisson between technicians and, and creators help us to could help us to navigate uh, emergent media such as AR or VR, which like sound films before them are without precedent. 
Sound that rings true for the spectator and sound that is true are two different things. In order to assess the truth of a sound, we refer much more to codes established by the cinema itself, by television and narrative representational arts in general. Quite often we have no personal memory we might refer to regarding a scene we see. So our ideas about what a gunshot or a breaking leg <laughs> sound like are probably taken from the archives of our film watching history. Um, and I would say that, you know, history lessons are, are available not just from uh, sound film. You know, we have uh, music recording practices where there was a spatial component to them. You know, they were hard, hard baking in distance and reverberation um, in a kind of arranged manner. So thinking about the, the, the kind of histories of those, I would suggest that it makes sense given whatever the application is. This ties into application. These are some of the things we can do with sound. So think about some of the histories behind these things and you might be able to think about how, not, not what established and then you import that as a mechanism, but how that established itself as a, um, a field, as a convention, you know, the conventions within that, what were the forces that, that kind of made them ossify over time. Okay, Karen Collins writes about game audio um, a lot. Sound design is, for the large part, much more, uh, much more creative than strictly technical practice. She talks about how to represent things like fictional spaces, psychological states, brands, the use of sound as a metaphor, counterpoint or symbol, um, and talks about the critical role that sound plays with emotional engagement. So there are all these things we can do with sound that, that have no kind of um, analogy in realism. OK, what can the contemporary learn from all this? A few years ago, this is pretty much how I felt working with spatial audio. I was like, oh, <laughs> it's a beast, where to begin? And then someone changes something and then that doesn't work and then you have to go back to that part. And I thought, well, okay, this is, this is where we're at. And it's also what makes it exciting, you tell yourself after many frustrating days. Um, but it's, it's moving on. I think, you know, solutions are getting refined and it doesn't feel like that so much. Um, the place mess has when it's not already in art, okay. Again, I'll say, unwritten rules, really exciting time. I would, you know, I would say it's, uh, it's up for grabs in terms of your imagination. And that's why I say, like, in, w with my talk, a lot of it will be about you and the way that you think conceptually, because I think that's really important. I think actually the genesis of an idea will arise within you, and then you may or may not be able to realise that technically, you may or may not have the right people around you to help you realise that, but it's an exciting space, and you know, go forth and just experiment, I think. Um, a lot of the work that I do, it's, you know, there's some insight, but there's a lot of trial and error. For every kind of block of insight I, I get, I've earned it with 10, 15 blocks of trial and error, so. Um, Experimentation is useful. Space people needed. Well, I just mean interdisciplinary, you know, practitioners. Um, I also think exposure and training effects. We don't have those. So the thing I was saying about VR and it's all novel and therefore we can't access detail when we're measuring people's experience of it. That's also why, if you develop expertise, you're on that Slack channel two years later. You're not. It's because there's no, you know, the experts don't really exist. There aren't those hierarchies at this point, and. Um, Exposure and training effects are, there, are therefore interesting if you want to, you know, my original PhD plan was to do a longitudinal study. I was like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and I'm going to conquer the world. And obviously at some point you get real and go, oh no, it's, time's running out, I'm not going to do those things. Um, but longitudinal work I think would be really interesting. I, I still think it would be really interesting, it's just I won't be the one to do it. Uh, Work's shown that ex repeated exposure to unfamiliar sounds increases the accuracy of auditory distance estimates. So a lot of it is about our exposure. Uh, I did already say that. And I'm just going to speculate on some strategies. Every time I look at this watch, it just tells me how many steps I've done or something irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> Speculative strategy. OK, this, I really enjoy this part. So I will just give you a few of the things I have thought about, considered, maybe even tried. In music cognition, we have a thing called uh, the liking complexity relationship. So studies have developed this idea, refined an idea that we are always most, having an optimal experience at the kind of uh, high point of, of the um, bell curve. And this bell curve 
um, you know, we, we will like something if it's not too boring to turn us off and not too complex to make us feel overwhelmed. And that curve will shift. So it will transpose itself a lot, you know, uh, along the complexity axis if we're growing, experiencing new things, developing our expertise, training, um, you know, listening to, to different types of music. Over time, that will move. My, my bell and your bell might be in different places, but we will always have a, a preferred place at the optimal point on that curve. And that comes out um, of music cognition research, as I've, as I've said. The reason I find this interesting is because, as I say, I like to think that we can disrupt some of these sound image relationships in immersive environments, the diegetic stuff, stuff that, you know, I would think that it's going to be coming from over here, but if it doesn't, will I understand that that's an aesthetic choice? Will it disrupt and surprise me so much that I'm overwhelmed? Or with exposure, will I start to understand? And could I do that? Does exposure mean I need to have worn a headset for like six months or I just need to be in a 10 minute film or a 10 minute piece of music with some, some image? Would it help if I uh, had, you know, different types of immersive experiences? Is it, is it gonna do one thing in a VR experience? Is it gonna do one thing in a um, installation art piece? Ultimately, you're looking at, in a probabilistic approach, you're looking at the disruption of expectation. And you want that to be in an optimal point. If you disrupt people and it's too chaotic, probably they're not going to like it. But if you do it systematically, this was my speculation, if I disrupt this systematically, people understand that it's a, a, an aesthetic choice. Um, jury's still out on that, I would say. But I, I still think this is my... This is a... a strategy that I really am going to go with. It can be argued that the violations lead to an increase in physiological arousal, which in turn leads to a heightened emotional experience of the musical pieces. Suspensions of musical expectations are an important pathway to generating emotions in the listener. I mean, you all know that. If, you know, as you're a kid, you're listening to wheels on the bus. It's not long before that you exhaust that. And, um, you know, at, at some point, Maybe people do plateau, or maybe not. If you're in the room, I think you've got an interest in audio and you're less likely to plateau. I was going to play some clips, but I'm not going to do that in the interest of time. Well, it's completely up to you. You do have time if you want to. Do I? OK. <laughs> OK. Just around expectation. Um, these are all in the kind of canon of personal and also collective experience. So I will say with this liking complexity relationship, I do think there's a kind of... Inf the infinite information horizon, we have archives of stuff that as a culture we have absorbed. Um, so you probably know this clip. good um so why might that have been an unusual pairing of sound and image at the time 70s 
Sorry? Yeah, okay, yeah. That's that is so. Do you think it's an interest like an unusual juxtaposition of like the particular piece of music given the subject matter? I mean now, okay, watching it now with our collective kind of um cultural archives available, what sense do you get from that? Is there is it ironic? Is it kind of being melodramatic? Is it serious? Is it an experimental film, sorry? Portentious. Portentious. Poor tentious. Poor Yeah. Um at the time that was a quite a risky move. And the other examples I had were similarly risky moves, just because there were conventions like you have a score, you have something that is scored to an existing piece of um, film. And, well, I mean, again, that's, you know, I don't know, that's like a subjective thing that we can say with the benefit of hindsight, I think. I don't know how it would have been in those times. Um, Certainly now, a lot of films that you would watch seem, you know, overdone, hammy, uh, hackneyed, other such words. But again, this is kind of individually and collectively shifting, I would say. Um, I won't play the other examples because they're, you know, saying, saying the same thing in different ways. But that's, um, yeah, I think those things are continually shifting. And <coughs> therefore, it is useful to think about things in some kind of historical context at some, I mean, there's so much written now about, about sound film, about the history of sound film. There's no shortage of resource that allows you to access some of these aesthetic um, histories and, and conventions. Okay, speculative strategy number two, semantics of space. So I had a brief exercise. I'm gonna to say to you the word left, abstract. Uh, no, no big deal, right? It's the word left. And then I'm gonna, just suggest, and I'm going to throw this over to you, but as an example, I'm going to suggest some of the things we might associate semantically with the word left. So, because we're potentially all audiophiles in the room, left could be less, because if you turn a dial on a piece of software or hardware, you're getting a potentially drier mix if you turn to the left with less or less volume or less whatever turning to the left. If I say left, it could mean liberal. Uh, if I say right, just throw out some of the semantics associated with that. Just an abstract word, in, right, in theory, but what are the associations? Correct. Correct. OK. Right means correct. Corrupt. Corrupt. <laughs> nice play on words. Anything else? Like, uh, as, as a human right or as a... Yeah. Yeah, as your as your right, your individual or collective right. Um, how about center? Mono. Mono, okay. Average. Average. Balanced. Balanced. How about top? Yeah, yeah, that is that is where we associate it. But semantically, what might be some of the associations when someone's at the top or not at the top or uh, reach the top? Yeah, there's a lot around this verticality actually. Um, we similarly, talk about top frequencies, high frequencies. We talk about brightening the top end. We do, yeah, bright and bright is a, a synonym for intelligent, right? Um, bottom probably just assume that that's many of the things uh, that oppose top and and so on and so on so if you talk about close and you talk about distant you can imagine that there's a a, a large semantic context to that um, so being on top of your game being on top of the world uh, being on top of a task like a deadline or rising to fame and fortune being at the peak of our performance looking up to someone high art high culture there's a lot in this verticality schema, but there's also quite a lot in terms of closeness and distance um, semantically. So this ties in um, to um, 
I think some of the, sorry, I'm, I'm ahead of myself. This ties in to some of the sound film practices and how they've come about. If we think about sound that's very close, human voice uh, in particular that's very close, if we think about people being distant or sound being distant, um, you know, we think about that in terms of aloof, aloofness. So what does that mean for sound in space? What do, how, do, how, how we might we exploit that semantically for sound in space? Would it be different if we exploited it in terms of human voice or kind of non-human sounding object? Um, add to that the fact that our language is visually biased. So there's ocular centricity, which, uh, you know, when we talk, it's, it's really difficult actually, and this is something that's come up during the work that I'm doing, to get people to describe things in auditory terms. We describe so much so easily visually. We'll see someone later, we'll go to see a film, we discuss a point of view. We speak of things like color and texture, even in sound, um, we, we kind of trans, uh, import visual terms. Uh, I won't say anything about the sonic turn at this point. Unrated constructs, things that I couldn't bring forward, and I'll just give you a flavor of those. And, how interesting some of these are, and I'd kind of like to poke at these more. Things like soft and low, or hard and high. These were the constructs, and I'm like, wow, all that's changed is the, the auditory event distance. <laughs> soft and low and hard and high, okay. Uh, pronounced and flat. It's, it's you know, I'd, it's all, the, the point of the repertory grid technique is that those constructs are valid for those people, and they use them more consistently. If I gave them a set of constructs, they would try and do the thing they think I want them to do. They would think that there's a correct and incorrect way of responding. And what I'm saying is, whatever your subjective experience is, it's, it's true for you. And I want to measure the thing that's true for you. Otherwise, you're trying to perform a task, which doesn't, isn't what I'm trying to get at. I'm going to skip over this, but Foucault has a really cute uh, uh, section. He's, he's quoting from... Uh, piece of Chinese literature about a, a, an existing cate, cate, a system of categorization. And this brings to life imagination, creativity, a sense of playfulness. You know, a lot of things that we consider to be the building blocks of create, creating work. So this sense of playfulness, I think, is really important, especially if you are doing kind of serious science. Um, I think it's, it's important to just, you know, go outside of that from time to time. The last thing I'm going to say, because I've been banging on about verticality schema, is a speculative strategy called embodiment. So I, again, love this work. I have not applied this, and I'm not going to get time to in my PhD, but I will do it beyond that. Basically, a lot of the language, a lot of the way of thinking that we have is derived from our physical engagement with the world. That's, that's what embodied cognition says. It says that a lot of what we're talking about in terms of up, down, it's, you know, it's, it comes from um, kind of basic physiological experience of interacting with our environments. Even things that seem innocuously value neutral about personal perception or physical control at first are actually social and moral and political systems and they change. So having a sense of what those um, semantics are, but then diving even deeper into that and examining where they may have come from, I think is interesting. Um, Feelings of body in the context of cinema recruit our body's innate capacity for feeling another's affective state offers an embodied and non-cognitive route to empathy. What does that mean? Um, I'm going to skip over these things because I've kind of just said that. I will. Um, uh, I'm going to I'm going to say this part. So what Juan Chata is saying here is that current trends in film scoring and uh, film sound design have moved away from associative music, things like the leitmotif, where a character appears and you have a certain motif musically. We've moved into um, practices that deal with sub-bass frequencies, that deal with long, uh, eerie, indistinct um, sounds, sounds that you couldn't say what the instrument is or the source is that's producing it, but they arrive through the incredible sound systems that are installed in most cinemas um, and even home systems now. And they've been developed in tandem with these systems. They arrive to the viewers in their body, in their viscera. So in that way, they connect what's happening with the scene, what's happening with the protagonist, um, 
to the audience through a very effective corporeal um, experience. And that's actually a big part of, of movie going practice. We kind of jump out of our seats, right? Because there are these sudden um, acoustic events that are pretty loud and pretty, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of sub bass happening in, in movie theatres these days. And that's, that's moving away from these more traditional light motifs and other strategies. Um, I'll skip over the examples as well, but I encourage you to check out. There's, you know, there's a book called Embodied Cognition, um, and it has a number of essays in it which are really interesting. If you're, you know, only a couple of them are about sound, but there's work done by this guy uh, which deals more with music and how you can think about embodiment in terms of expressivity. So the two defining characteristics of what makes a uh, a musician expressive are their dynamic variation and their temporal variation, right? So how much they vary volume and, and how they're phrasing um, a musical phrase in time. And he says that those you can map quite clearly to ideas of um, effort and ease. So as you go in, uh, you know what, I'm not going to explain it because I think I'm running out of time, but I encourage you to check him out. Okay. We can draw from various places, but I've given you a few ideas. I just wanted to really briefly, 10,000 steps, talk about my work. Um, <laughs> so this is this film, and I have tried out some different strategies. One of the things I would say about this piece of work is um, I did it with a theatre director, myself as a sound person, and a film DOP, and that was a super interesting process. It was really useful to have the theatre person um, because we had a moving set, which was my original idea was to just, I thought, well, let's take the central conceit of VR and you can't have scene changes. And people at that time said, you can't do jump cuts and you can't do this. So I thought, well, let's, let's actually make the scene happen within um, a kind of physical structure. So that's what we did. We green screen stuff. It was an ambitious undertaking and uh, it's been a really long, <laughs> It's been a really long journey and it's unfortunately not quite over yet, but um, it's because you can't sustain the motivation <laughs> indefinitely. But it comes in, it comes in waves and uh, I think we're at the stage where it's not much to get it finished. But the thing that I would talk to you about, because some of you will listen to this in a moment, is even when I presented it, that's actually where we um, talked about it initially, in uh, a, uh, a symposium festival in Germany and there were, you know, the 3D audio experts, that's, that's what the symposium was about. And I told them that the sound was interactive. <laughs> and then I sat them down and they watched it and they didn't get the interactive sound parts. So it, I feel like I have to be more obvious if I want that to be a thing. I personally don't want it to be a thing. I don't think it's important. I'm not trying to look for um, kudos, but there is a creative, in brackets, tension between emotional engagement and interaction which is a point of contention amongst various theorists that they say, well, if you're being really interactive, then you're not emotionally engaged. And I kind of think that's true. Like if we're very task oriented, if we go, oh, there's interactive sound at some point, then we're trying to work out where it is, when it is, how I can affect it. You know, you get, you're listening to the feedback. You're disengaging with the emotional journey of the characters. Um, so for me, I don't necessarily want to make the sound overly interactive, but there is interactive sound in that. And even if I've told you now, you may not, you may not know. Uh, this was another piece I prototyped for an installation. As you pulled the cord uh, and the object moved up into the air, you got a different distance uh, experience auditory, auditorily, if that's a word. And I worked with a guy, uh, a geoscientist, it's about um, marine acoustic pollution, this piece. So I worked with a, a, a geoscientist in the States with his data. And I just wanted to see, do we, is it different if we're not in a, we're in an immersive experience here, right? So it's audio, it's visual, you're actually interacting with it. But if you're interacting and it's not virtual, are you paying more attention? Are you attending? Are you not kind of um, having a moment in new technology? And you and people were attending much more. Unfortunately, that's not going to make it into the PhD, but it will make it into my life. Because <laughs> it's nice to make stuff that's not in virtual reality sometimes. Um, this is a system called the Eco. I am in love with this speaker array and was from the moment I saw it. It's uh, 20 speakers on a lollipop and they are highly directional and it works 
in an environment, so you situate it in a space and you play the space with it, it works on direct and reflected sound and you have reflector boards. And depending on where you put it and how you arrange the reflector boards, you get a really different experience. So the composition is incredible. And I worked with it for, <coughs> with, with a few other people for a week. My spatial hearing was fundamentally disrupted. It was incredible. And all of ours were. Um, so I think I'm gonna change my research proposal. I've got uh, a residency with these guys for five months next summer. Yes. It's like all oh, my Christmas has come at once. I'm so excited. Uh, but I think I'm going to change my research proposal because the interesting thing about working with the technology is the thing it does to you is the impact it has on your perception sometimes. So you come to it with a unconscious biases from stuff you've done, but then, you know, it's good to be open to what's in front of you and adjust. And I'm not going to say anything about that. And all I was going to say here is, leading off my point about spatial hearing, Try and develop a practice of listening. That's what I do. Um, and, and you know, it's always, it's always an ask. It's never something that is to be taken for granted. Even I bang on about how important listening is, I still have to practice it. It's an active practice. So designing sound, um, as Ross Brown says, involves abstraction of self and the environment in order to develop a conceptual working model, which is then translated back into immersive experience. One might describe it as a process of listening, hearing, into thinking, into sounding. Too often, though, the first stage is skipped or taken for granted. I guess people, we all think we can listen, because we do. But active listening is really different. If you have your work um, performed, uh, if, if you're in a performative concert setting, for example, and you have a piece of fixed media performed, you hear it differently because others are really attending to it. They probably hear it differently, but you certainly do. So depending on the quality of your listening, depending on the quality of the, the listeners around you, you will have a fundamentally different perceptual experience. And I really underline that. I, you know, that doesn't stack up scientifically, but that's my direct experience. And I trust my direct experience above anything else. So I encourage you, listen, listen, listen. Um, and the last thing I will say is, and this I think comes from my experience with art is the value of asking a good question to so not thinking that you, you have answers. And actually I think listening is useful for this because the more you listen, the more you can actually formulate um, a meaningful question. Thanks. Thank you so much. That was really interesting how you drew also such different fields between science and art and design and engineering. Thank you so much. Welcome. We do have a few minutes for questions and afterwards you are very welcome to stay if you want to and, and test the system. That's why we set it up so we want you to test it. Yeah. You, uh, it, it going back to your <coughs> research where you had the three of you and the buzzers in different locations, I was wondering whether... Uh, and you're talking about having a VR headset and the distortion of distance when you've got a headset on. Um, what about, would it make any difference if you take the visual elements away? So you do exactly the same set of tests in terms of people defining how far away the sound is, how close it is, without the visual cue. Would they be any more accurate or not? Uh Recent, I mean, research has shown that, that de it depends on experimental design. What you're saying is have them in a headset with headphones or...? Yes, yeah, so essentially headphones, so you've, you've got sound cue without the picture. Yeah, I mean, there's image. not... Visual, visual capture was such a strong element that I would say yes. Um, and, and some studies have shown yes, and other studies have not. So it's, it's, I can't give you a kind of definitive answer, but I would suggest, given that how how strongly visual capture um, impacted the study, yeah. Some of, the, some of the subsequent work I'm doing is going to be sound only, but yeah, I guess in an immersive environment you often have a, a visual component, so I was trying to dig into that. Mm. Yeah. Headphones. Uh, no, it was recorded. It was mono, so the sort of spatialized, spatial information from the stereo recording wasn't 
No, it wasn't stereo or mono. So it was a sound field recording, an ambisonic recording. Oh, no, sorry. Effectively, yeah. they were getting the vinyl. Yeah. Yeah, they were getting a vinyl, done out of vinyl rendering, so a head tracked rendering. Ears? Sorry? For whose ears? Oh, uh, it's a generic HRTF set. So, so you're not just testing the accuracy of the generic HRTF? No, because so? not everybody prefers their own HRTFs. Pardon? People don't necessarily prefer their own HRTFs. Actually, with dynamic head track, with head tracking, that really reduces the impact of individualised HRTFs. So it's not, it's not a, a deal breaker by any means. And I, for one, have tried out somebody else's HRTFs and my own. I've AB'd them and I've preferred theirs. So I'll say, and you know, we really, I mean, York is the place for HRTF research, but I would say it's not, it's not something that would undermine the um, results of your research. What about the, the point of blind listening tests? I mean, so much of, of what we do when we're listening, when we're AB'ing EQ, no EQ, we know what we're listening to. We know we're listening to the bypass, we know we're listening to the EQ, you listen to monitors, we, you, you know what the answer is. There is a huge bias taking place. I'm just thinking about the HTR, the, the head transfer. You knew which was yours. No, I didn't. No, no, no. Okay. Yeah. I guessed, and I guessed across a range of um, sound sources, consistently, the other person's. <laughs> Who knows? Is there any other questions? Sure, that was a stretch of custom work. <laughs> okay. Last chance, yeah, Bobby. Um, just really quickly, can you run us through how you like implemented the audio and everything for the uh, for this project that you have here? Uh, I took a I took a sound field recording. Yeah. I also took lav mic recordings, um, and then I made a big mistake and took it into a DAW, which I would not do if it was going into Unity. Um, so I, everything sounded amazing in Reaper. It was absolutely, you know, it was pristine. Um, I then took it into, I, I actually got rid of the sound field mic because it was in that environment. If I go back, uh, in, in this space, it was too reverberant. And so it was, it was pretty messy. And so I took it down in the mix, down in the mix, down, and eventually I was like, get rid of it altogether. And so I just worked with the lab mic recordings. Um, and did all of that in the DAW, exported it as an ambisonic file, brought it into Unity, where I was doing the real-time synthesis for the interactive sound. And at that point, I was completely dismayed by the, I'm assuming, I, I, I think decoder, the decoder in Unity for ambisonics just really wasn't satisfying did you try to me. Any other I tried all of the available decoders, yeah. Right. Um, none of them worked very well but the thing I would say is that it's continually shifting so at the point I did the first uh, version of it you could only get first order ambisonics in unity as I understand it now you can get second order um, I don't know if you can yet get higher order but clearly you know people are beavering away every day at this yeah. um, and so if I was going from scratch, I just wouldn't do anything in a, in a DAW. I would go through. I don't know how I would do it in Unity because it would become such a pain to do it. But I might start grouping things. Or I might, you know what, I think, I think object-based audio is the coolest thing. I think that's really going to, you know, that's where it, for me, all starts making sense. So that's, I would adjust my workflow significantly. Yeah. Um, for people interested in getting into virtual reality and spatial technologies uh, that already have a mild background in sound. Do you have any suggestions to how to get started? Like what specific um, aspects to cover to have like a good introduction and then to just go with the flow? Well, you're in York. So I would say that's a really good place to be for <laughs> ambisonic. Um, legacy and uh and ambisonics i pretty sure is un an unavoidable area uh and it's you know there are lots of really good applications of ambisonic use in spatial audio if you want to deal with non-ambisonic uh panning techniques or, or object-based audio you know you could look at uh something like spat which is a bunch of externals for max or you could look at, um, I mean, a lot of the object-based 
solutions are, are for broadcasters, so they tend to be. So it's really nice. Um, you know, the interfaces are nice and cooperative, but that means they're quite expensive. Uh, we we I managed to persuade people to buy some uh, at my university, but I guess uh, possibly object based is like you know the next the next um, level. I would say game audio is a is a good place to get some chops because not only in technical terms but in terms of their history, they've been working in a uh, kind of s surround audio at least, or you know ways immersive. Uh, ways with audio for some time and you know generative ways of composing for some time Dep it depends on i guess it depends on exactly what you want to do but you, you know certainly ambisonics i think is an important thing and um i mean reapers are great daw I, as much as i've just said i i wouldn't do that again um I think Reaper's a great DAW, so you, you've got tons of plugins free. Everything they've made everything free, but certainly between Unity, Reaper, Spat, Spat costs money. Um, yeah, between between those things, you can get a really good start and and just start going. I mean, it depends, you know, if you want to be on the post production side or audio programming or location based stuff, but just start working on stuff, and then you'll learn through through the kind of current pipelines, which, as I say, are always changing. Yeah. Time for a very quick question. If anyone has one, any questions? No. If there aren't any questions, then please join me in thanking Angela for a wonderful talk.